are watching online, why don't we give it up for them one time? Welcome, welcome. If you're watching from a different state, whether you're in Georgia or Colorado or Texas or Canada, a few weeks ago I had someone in Canada, I just want to say welcome. We'd love for you to shoot us a DM where we can send a t-shirt to you. We'd love to bless you that way. But we are in a series called Honest Moments, Honest Moments, and we are in the book of James. This is now the fourth week. Anybody excited about the book of James? We are going through a book study, and we're taking it verse by verse. James is five chapters, so we're in the fourth week. So we're in James chapter four this morning. If you want to pull out a physical Bible, a smartphone, whatever, we'll have it on the screen. But James is five chapters, and James is the brother of Jesus, and he's pausing to encourage a group of scattered believers. Everybody say the gathering. Gathering. Everybody say the scattering. scattering. The gathering of the believers is what's happening this morning, right? And this is a time where we're encouraged, we're edified. And if you're watching online or in the room and, and you're not a believer, we want you to know you are welcome here. That we want to talk to you this morning. That we want to meet you exactly where you're at. No matter what faith background you're coming from, you belong here. But everybody say the scattering. Yeah. See, the scattering is what happens Monday through Saturday. And I'm just as concerned, and all of us should be, what happens outside the four walls as we are in here, right? Okay, nobody else? Okay. No. Just say Amen. Okay, okay, amen. All right, all right. Let's just bring it back to the mission vision for a second. Everybody say for the one. We are for the one here. So we didn't start this church to try to put on the best Sunday service ever to try to compete with someone else. We started this church so that people who are far from God would come to know Jesus and we could say welcome home, welcome home. So we want to empower and unleash you to go and do that, to be the hands and the feet of Christ in the world. And so James is pausing And he's saying, I want to encourage. Turn to your neighbor and just say, I want to encourage you. James, your neighbor's like, what are you going to encourage me with next? Okay. (laughs) Encourage them after the service. But James is pausing and he's saying, I want to tell you as a brother of Jesus, literally a biological brother of Jesus, someone who has literally witnessed the resurrection and someone who's been walking and talking with disciples who have known Jesus, ate with Jesus. I mean, think about this. James is the brother of Christ. He's gotten to see him grow up. The Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. At one church, we don't believe that Christianity is one of the religions. We believe Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no other way to heaven but except through Christ. And so James is watching Christ grow up. Jesus is fully God, fully man. So in his humanity, he's watching him grow up. It says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with man and with God. He's watching him talk to people. He's watching him, recognizing that Jesus isn't afraid to sit with sinners and tax collectors. And the religious, the Pharisees, are giving him flack for that, right? He's watching Jesus look upon the world, a bunch of sinners who deserve nothing. And it says Jesus was full of compassion, that he saw people differently than you and I, right? And so we get into chapter 4, and I'm so excited as we continue. But the title of the sermon this morning is Fixed and Focused. Fixed and Focused. Focus. James chapter 4. Let's jump in. James says this, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? I mean, just pause right here. Maybe you were in an argument with someone this week. Maybe it was your spouse. Maybe it was a, a brother or a family member or a friend or a coworker. Like, we know what it feels like to carry the weight of, everybody say, disunity. Like, when you're disunified, with a friend, with a coworker, can't you feel that? You can feel that physically on your shoulders sometimes, right? Some of you are right there this morning. He says, what causes these things? Don't they come from within you? Verse 2, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill, right? We don't kill often, right? If you're saying, I'm a, I'm a good person, I've never killed anybody. But maybe we're not canceling them, right, with our mouth, but we've canceled them in our heart. Jesus said, if you look upon someone with hate in your heart, you've killed somebody, right? Jesus always takes it a step higher. You covet, you you have jealousy in your heart, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive. See, I, I feel like recently, as I'm just unpacking this for a second, how many times lately the Lord has challenged me to pray in detail, not just I'm at the table, God, I thank you for my food, I thank you for my family, in Jesus' name, amen. Bless this McDonald's Happy Meal and make it healthy for me, right? Anybody ever done that? You're about to eat Chick-fil-A and you're just like, God, I believe this is blessed, but it is fried. So if you could just somehow work this out for my good, right? Are you with me? 
But instead of just praying the basics, I challenge you this morning to pray in detail. God, I thank you and I ask you, I'm going to bring you into my prayer life, that, that when I prepare my message this week, that I would hear from you, that every commentator I look at, that every scripture I look at, that you would send illustrations and pictures and colors. How many of you want to pray in detail this week? Because God answers in detail. If you don't ask him in detail, you might miss it or he might not answer in detail. Ask him. On a lighthearted note, I can't tell you how many times we've been on Delta or Southwest and we pray, Jesus, give us nice people to sit next to because we have a one-year-old that might be crying. How many times, Leanne, I don't know if you're even in here, how many times have we seen that prayer answered? Every time. God answers in detail. Sometimes we don't have because we just haven't asked him. We don't have peace because we haven't asked for peace. We don't have encouragement because we haven't asked for encouragement, right? But he is your father. He's your father. Some of you only, maybe you're watching online or in the room, you've only known God as judge. Man, one day, God's going to judge everything I do. I hope I'm a good person. I hope I get in. And God wants to help you recognize he's not only your judge, he's your father. He created you. He's your friend. He knows you by name. It says Moses would speak to God face to face as one speaks to a, as a friend. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the judge, but he also is the king, and he's our friend. This is who God is. But maybe you haven't asked, or maybe you ask with wrong motives. God, I just thank you that you would give me that Lamborghini. No, 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 wait, wait. Jesus says, ask anything according to my will, and it shall be done. That anything Jesus promised you, you can speak and say, it is done. It is so. God, you promised this, so in Jesus' name, I claim this is already done. But some of us try to do that with the Lamborghini. He never promised you, right? Or the job or the spouse. God, I thank you, it's mine. Did he say it was yours? Right? Maybe you ask with wrong motives so that you can spend on what you get for your pleasures. Verse 4. You adulterous people, right? He's really stepping on some toes. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? But here, let me pause here. When you look up the translation of this word in the Greek, enmity, it's not talking about a friendship like, hey, I'm friends with Steve or I'm friends with, you know, Sam or someone. This is talking about like a covenant relationship that someone would have with the world, that they are yoked to the world, right? You get the difference here? Because some people would say, oh my gosh, the Bible, we take it out of context, right? The Bible says don't have friendship with the world, but they haven't studied the grammatical, the contextual, the historical part. We want to do shopping cart Christianity and say, this is what the Bible says. No, no, no. Look at it in its context. Everybody say context. You have to know the context. And if you're really interested in that, look up Blue Letter Bible. It's a free app. Just download it. Click on the Greek words of those texts, and it'll help you know. This isn't just for those who have gone to ministry school. This is for everyone, right? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God, being yoked to the world. You adulterous people, right? Verse 5, or do you think Scripture says that without reason he jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us? I am a father, an earthly father, and you know what I want more than anything? It's for my daughter to know me. That she would know that she is loved. See, everything in Scripture, we're going to talk about kind of what happens when we meet God face to face one day. You know what it says in Corinthians? That the greatest of these are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That every challenge God gives you, every task that he puts before you, every sacrifice, and every time he asks you to suffer and take up your cross, do you know it comes from a place of love? Everything comes back to love. That before the beginning of time, before you even were born on this planet, God loved you. Right? And we're numb to that as believers often. Jesus died for me. He loves you. No, no, no. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Jesus was tortured for you. He was publicly humiliated for you. That every single thing that he calls you to do comes from a place of love. He's not going to ask you to do anything that he wasn't willing to do for you first. Are you with me this morning? So here's the first point. Each of us have a customized race to run. A customized race to run. To run. Everybody just repeat this after me. I have a race. I have a lane. Let's say it again. I have a race and I have a lane. Okay, so I, I want you to know very plain and simple that 
that you're not just called to exist here. That you weren't created to just get by to the next day. And, and it's okay to not be okay. If you, if you feel like you walked in this morning, you're like, Andy, I had such a tough week, I just wanted to get here. Anybody like that? I kind of felt that way this week. But I want to encourage you, you're not called to just exist. You're not called to just get to tomorrow to make sure you get up for work on time. You have a God-given calling on your life, every single one of you. Whether you're a believer or not, he has called you to something very unique and specific. But it's up to each of us if we answer that call, right? So I want to put up a a, a phrase, uh, not a phrase, a graphic on the screen. Because I don't want to just tell you audibly. I want to show you visually. So let's put this up. Everybody say identity. Your identity never changes. Are you, are you with me? That before the beginning of time, God made us male and female. He gave us an identity, right, that is in the cross. I put the cross here very specifically because your identity never changes. That's a very countercultural thing to say. But your identity is only in Christ. It's not based on how you feel. It's not based on how you got up the next day. Actually, Scripture says our heart is deceitful above all things. That if we follow our feelings, it won't lead to our destiny. It'll lead to destruction. And I love you enough to tell you that your identity is in Christ. That this identity is unshakable. That this identity doesn't depend on whether you felt like getting out of bed or not. Your identity was already decided before the beginning of time. I am a son of God. You're a daughter of the Most High. You are loved. You are chosen. You are set apart. You are known. You are accepted, right? And it all comes back to the cross. Not in what you do, not in how you feel, but in who he says you are. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that this morning. That before the beginning of time, God already decided for me, and all I had to do was just say yes. And to be really real, I think in our culture, we have too many choices. We're on anxiety overload. And I'm thankful that there's a few things in life that God just already decided for us. I'm so thankful for that. And I'm so thankful that all I have to do is just say, yes, Lord. And then he gives us free will. Everybody say free will. will. See, this is the tension that we're called to manage, that God is sovereign, but he also gives us free will. And in our human mind, intellectually, we can't figure that out. Wait, so God, you're totally sovereign. You're in control of my life, but yet you give decisions for me to still make, right? James says that God does not tempt anyone. So God does not control us like a puppet. He doesn't control us like a robot. He didn't make you sin. You chose to sin. Right? The goodness of God before the beginning of time, he created us and sin separated us. So everybody say identity. Some of you are already writing me off, but I love you enough to just tell you scripture. Everybody say calling. All right, so let's go to the next one. Here is my calling. I want you to know this first and foremost. I'm writing this how this works in my mind. This is for me. And I encourage you, if you do not know this, write this down this week. This is really important how we separate the three of these. So my first calling, you know what has gripped me, is before I ever answer to God on Judgment Day about what happened with one church, I'm going to answer with what happened with Lienza. That I'm going to answer for my daughter after, and then my ministry. Are you with me? This is my first calling. And at times, you know what the enemy wants to do to pastors? He wants them to obsess over the work and worship the calling over their family. Can I just be really transparent with you? I've done that. I've done that. We were in a counseling session recently with a guy that we trust and love. And in our marriage, we've, we've, we've been thriving. We've been really having a great marriage set apart, known by God. But at the same time, sometimes We try to find our identity in our calling. Are you with me? We try to find out who we are by what we do or how we feel. But but scripture says, no, 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 Jesus is a firm foundation that with him at our right hand, we are not easily shaken. So everybody say family. So family first, right? But then this is the calling. This is part of the vision of One Church. This comes straight from my heart to you, that as we look throughout Scripture, we are called to reach, connect, empower, and unleash. This is my calling, 
And my calling is to empower you, to equip you, to go and do these things. And then trailblaze. This is one of the things that the Lord has called me to do, to create, to start, to launch things. This is my calling. But let's go to the assignment. This is the three recent assignments that God had given me. And I just encourage you, if you're taking notes, write this down for your life. What is my identity? What does the Bible say about who I am? You are loved. You are chosen. You are a son. You are a daughter of the Most High. You were bought with a price. I mean, memorize that. Repeat that. When those negative thoughts come into your mind, when you look into the mirror and you think you're ugly, you think you're not worthy of love, check what the Bible says about you and start declaring that thing out loud. No, 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 Satan, I rebuke you. In Jesus' name, I am loved. I am anointed. I am called. This is, everybody say, identity. Identity Identity is key to everything. And then we go to calling. See, our identity flows into our calling. So that I walk into the room at one church, this is how God wants it to be, that I already know who I am, that I don't need you guys to tell me who I am. That I don't need applause from you to make me feel good about myself. That I don't need you to to repost my sermon on YouTube, but I already know who I am. And I found it right here. I already know. And I don't say that out of arrogance. I say that out of confidence that this is how God designed it. So then I know what I'm called to do. This is my lane. Everybody say, I have a lane. You have a God-given, specific, customized, unique lane to run in. And if I'm being real, there's been so many times in my life I look to the left and I look to the right. And then this is what we do when we start to compare ourselves. We want to find our calling in our assignment. God, can, can you tell me, these college students that I'm preaching to, that I'm leading, can, can you help me uh, have them show me like what I'm called to do for the rest of my life? No, 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 no. See, this is when we start using people to make us feel good about ourselves, to to make us feel like we know who we are now. No, no, no. Your identity flows into your calling. Your calling flows into your assignment. God, it doesn't matter what I do. If I'm doing youth ministry, if I'm doing one church, if I'm doing college ministry, you have called me to keep my family first. You've called me to reach, connect, empower, unleash. This is my lane. And all of us will answer for our lane. Not for your neighbor. Not for your spouse, not for your daughter, not for your son. You will answer one day to God, what did you do with the time, talent, and treasure that was entrusted to you? What did you do? But your assignment is always changing, right? Your identity never changes. Your calling kind of changes because it kind of gets more narrow. Let's put up the next graphic. See, this is how I would put it. Your identity never changes. This is your lane. This is your calling. And notice how the calling gets more narrow as you go because your circle becomes more narrow the deeper you go. That when you first started following Jesus, you could kind of be friends with everyone and acquaintances with everyone. And then the deeper you go, you realize you need two, three people that are going to keep you accountable. You need two, three people that are not going to tell you what you want to hear but what you need to hear. And it gets more narrow and narrow. Your calling gets more defined. And right now, some of us are working a job, and we're working on an assignment. Everybody say, assignment. So maybe you work as a marketing director. Maybe you're a pharmacist. I shouted out EP. You notice that? (laughs) Maybe you work at the gym. It doesn't matter. But right now, all of us have an assignment. But too many of us are trying to find our calling from our assignment. That God wired you a certain way to think a certain way. Maybe you're creative. Maybe you're entrepreneurial. Maybe you're great with kids. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher or a children's ministry director. You're fulfilling your calling. But we have anxiety overload, so we have no idea who we are, what we're called to do, because we're trying to find who we are from what we do. But my identity is always in the cross. You know what success is for me up here? Are you ready? It's obedience. Like when I meet God face to face one day, and I hope, man, God, I just hope that we planted churches and we multiplied and we reached the masses. Man, I, I have big dreams for this church, y'all. That when God called me to start this church and called our family, I believe we'll reach millions of people. I believe that. But even if we don't, my identity was never in that. And the success was never about how well this goes. It was if I obeyed. See, what Jesus is teaching me right now, in John 15, he says, remain in my love, right? Anybody know that? 
This isn't about striving. This isn't about earning. This isn't about manipulating, distorting. This is about actually falling in love with Jesus. Like, let me ask you that question. Are you in love with Jesus this morning? Like, like not did you show up at church because you felt like you had to, but really all of this comes back to being in love with him. Because if you're not in love with Jesus, then eventually the calling becomes your God. The assignment becomes your Lord. Your spouse becomes your God. The spouse you're praying for becomes your God. Are you in love madly with Jesus? Everything else will fall into place. Everything else will fall into place. So Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us. The writer of Hebrews is saying, you have a race and you have a lane. Verse 2, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Can I show you a, a video of what happens when we take our eyes off of Jesus? Is that cool? Let's breathe for a second. All right, let's watch this. Personality-wise, nothing has changed. No, and, and look, Coach Malone very cautiously compared him to a Tim Duncan. You see Steph Curry knock down a three. He's so excited to see one drop, even in the preseason, just trying to get his rhythm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he dribbled. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Too much celebration there, Steph. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully we show the whole thing. Knocks it down. Pulls it out. He's going to stare at it. Start jumping up and down. Just so excited. But maybe a little too excited because he trips over the wall. All right, can we just look at LeBron's face right here? Anybody else see that? <laughs> or Steph? Okay. All right, that's my favorite part. All right, all right, so, so back to, to the word here. When we take our eyes off of Jesus, we get tripped up. This is what happens. This is what the, writers of, the writer of Hebrews is saying, that the moment you start comparing yourself on Instagram to the left and to the right person that, man, they're your friend, but you're kind of jealous that they're further along in life than you, or, you know, you, you're, you're maybe in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you're looking at, like, that, that family that just looks like a perfect family. Why are they so perfect? Our family's messed up, right? Everybody's family's messed up. All right, can we just say that? But what happens is, to say it a different way, insecurity leads to drifting. So really, James is saying, hey, you're coveting, you're, you're, you're jealous of someone else. But that's not the root issue. See, we read the Bible and we treat it like it's a bunch of behavior modification. Okay, I need to like not cuss. I need to make sure that I'm pure in my thoughts. I need to make sure that, like, I read my Bible because I want to, not because I have to, right? When really, James is saying, there's a deeper issue here. You don't know your identity. You don't know your calling. You aren't secure in the assignment that God has called you to fulfill, so you drift. And you start looking at someone else's life, and you start looking at their highlight reel, and you just feel really, really small inside. Why? Because you took your eyes off of Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith. So James 4, 2, you desire, but you do not have. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So let me take that a step further. Jealousy that leads, insecurity leads to jealousy, right? So if you don't know your identity, your calling, your assignment, then naturally you're going to shift to jealousy, and then jealousy leads, let me take that a step further, to digging up someone else's lane. Not only are you drifting, but then you want to try to find out something that they did wrong so you can, like, have some, some business about them. Like, did you see so-and-so? They post all this stuff on Facebook, right? But I know what they did behind the scenes, right? And to be really real, we spend more time watching someone else's lane than fulfilling our own. You know what the saddest thing would be to get to heaven one day? And Jesus tell you that you spent more time comparing yourself to someone else than fulfilling your own? Wouldn't that be sad? And yeah, you're saved. Like, welcome on in, right? But he had something so much bigger for you, but you took your eyes off of him. You got complacent. You got apathetic. You kind of just started to settle. Like, I made it this far, so I might as well just kind of coast. But you have a race to fulfill that no one else can. You have a lane on your life, it was marked for you. 
I don't know where you're coming from, but I'd take that even a step further to say this. When your identity is in what you do, you can only mourn when others are blessed. That when, uh, when someone else is having a wedding, you have a funeral in your heart. That when someone else lands that job that you wanted so badly, you're having your own funeral in your heart. You're saying, I'm so excited for you, but deep down you're like, I hate you, right? I've done that before. I've been there before. I battle this stuff all the time. And what the Lord always brings me back to, Andy, it's not about what you're doing right now. It's not about how big the church is. It's not about how many people show up. It's really, are you in love with me? And I come back. And then I drift. God, I, I'm really excited about this. And then I'm looking and I'm comparing. I'm looking and I'm getting distracted. And then, you know, all this stuff. And the Lord is so kind. He just says, come back. Come back. Remain in my love. But we love him because he first loved us, right? This is not a one-way relationship. But we're always responding to the initiative from the hand of God. So I'm being real with you. I, I shared with you that there were different points on this journey with Lienz and I where, where we got into a few fights about this. And let me re really transparent with you. This was not a behavior modification thing. This was a priorities issue. This isn't about your mouth or how you look at others and say all these things. Yeah, yeah, that's like more up here. But the deeper issue is what are your priorities? Does Jesus come first? Does your family come second? And then what you do, it will flow into place. I promise you, Matthew 6, 33 through 34 is really clear. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. What does it say? Seek the kingdom first, and all else just falls into place. Fall in love with Jesus. Let him be your master. Let him be your, not only your savior, but your Lord. Everything else will be taken care of. So let me ask you this question this morning. Are you in love with what God can do for you or for who he is? Because when the blessing of God comes, we serve a blessing-filled Lord. Can I get an amen? And, and he, he crafts circumstances and situations because your name was on that. He positions you with favor. There's nothing you could do to get in that room at this time for such a time as this. But he just positioned you, right, by his hand. But then this is what happens when the blessing of God comes on our life, right? This is what happens. We start to fall in love for what he can do for us. And not for who he is. And then we start praying for more blessing. God, I just need a little bit more. God, I need I, just a little bit more of a salary. God, I need a little bit more square footage. I need a little bit more friends in my life. And then I'll be happy. But Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. That when I find my identity, my security, my strength, my source of joy in who he is, everything else is added Here's the second point for us this morning. Sometimes in this journey, you're going to have to run against the wind. James 4, 6 through 10, let's read this. But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist. Everybody say resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. He calls them double-minded. Man. Talking about stepping on toes. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Really what he's saying is, he's not saying have a bad attitude, walk around with downcast face. He's really saying humble yourself. Like you're celebrating, partying, doing whatever you want, but scripture's really clear. Don't use your freedom to do whatever you want. Use your freedom to serve one another in Christ, right? He's just saying humble yourself, verse 10, before the Lord, he will lift you up. Let's just read this together. Make sure we're awake. Humble yourselves. Let's read it all together. You ready? Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So I'm going to talk about a word that some of us don't like to talk about, and I'm going to unpack it. You ready? The word authority. The moment I say that, it's like, I am my own boss. I am my own God. All right? We feel the pride rising at the moment I say authority, Right? But scripture is really clear that we're not supposed to just submit to Jesus as a savior, but as Lord. When we say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior, a lot of us are praying half of that prayer. Lord, if you would just be my savior so that like when my car breaks down and like I need you on this test and I need you in this relationship, like last second, right? 
but he's also supposed to be our Lord. And, and here's the beautiful part is God does not shame this. And this is where I started too. God, I'm just praying for miracles and that's basically it. And then you fall in love with him and you don't want to give everything to him out of obligation, but out of blessing. It's my joy to give everything to you, Lord. It's my joy to surrender this. So when I say the word authority, most Christians are unaware of their spiritual authority or they abuse their spiritual authority. And, and hang with me here for a second. Luke 10, 19, Jesus says this, I've given you, what does it say? Authority. Jesus has given us as disciples authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome the power of the evil one. Like, aren't you grateful for that? Can we just praise the Lord for that? Come on, one time, let's praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that when anxiety and discouragement and depression come my way, we can pause and, yes, seek out mentoring, seek out counseling, seek out therapy. I spent time in counseling this week, you guys. As your pastor, that is really, really worth your time, I promise. But aren't you thankful that no weapon formed against us shall prosper? that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, right? That we can say, devil, flee from me, right? And he will. But we have to, everybody say, resist. So most of us, maybe we're unaware or we abuse that spiritual authority. And you see church movements and people all the time like, God, I thank you for the Lamborghini. And, the, you know, and I was like, wait, wait, what? Like, like Jesus says, ask anything according to my will and it will be done. So let's read this again, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Here's how I want to put it this morning. If you're, if you're taking notes, authority comes from alignment with him. Here's what I mean by this. In other words, it's not our authority. It's not our authority, but it's his. So James 4, 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend on what you get on your pleasures. Here's how I would say this. Bending will lead to boldness. So really, your authority to say, devil, flee from me, it comes from right here. And it doesn't come from you saying, I have this personality where I'm really strong, you know, I tell the devil what to do. No, 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 no. The devil's not concerned about you. He doesn't care about you. You know what he's concerned about? The Jesus in you. I heard a pastor say this, bent knees break chains. That when you get on your knees, you know, I come to my knees every single sermon, it feels like. Why? Because this is where everything's at. This is where everything is at, right here. If there's anything you take from this series, just memorize right here. This is where everything you need is at. So, do you know what resist means? You ready? This is the Greek translation of resist. Resist means to stand up against, okay? So resist basically means, everybody say, to stand up. Okay, now you ready for this? You can't stand up to the devil. You cannot stand up to the devil if you haven't bowed down to Jesus. And too many of us are like, devil, flee from me. He's not concerned about you. You don't have the willpower. You don't have the strength. The moment you go to your knees, then he's a little concerned. Because you're not tapping into your authority. You're tapping into his. Like, the, the, the reason why I can get up here and preach with authority is not because I'm a brave person. It's because I spent so many stinking hours right here. That's where my authority comes from. It's not mine. He has given it to us. So let me just be so transparent with you. You know how many times in basketball in school, I thought I was so weak and I'm scrawny. I'm still 145 pounds, okay. All right, you with me? But, but then the Lord showed me, no, 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 Andy, you're a lion because I said you're a lion. It doesn't matter what they said. It doesn't matter how much your coach thought you were weak. It doesn't matter how much you were pushed around with screens and pick and rolls. No, no, I said you're strong, so I am strong. Are you with me? But you can't stand up to the devil if you haven't bowed down to Jesus. It says the devil is a roaring lion. Actually, it says he's like a roaring lion. He's like a roaring lion. It doesn't say he is but he has a loud mouth and no bite. Are you with me? But he will absolutely devour you if you do not spend time here. He will. And not many pastors will probably tell you that, but I'll tell you that. You can't just walk into church and be like, hey, let me get my coffee. No, no. If you don't spend time there, you have no authority. You have no confidence. You have no peace. Your mind is all over the place. You're, you're worried about lustful things and all these things. No, no, no. Jesus says, seek the kingdom first right here. 
all else will be given to you. Why? Because this is the place of alignment. It's not, it's not the position, it's about the posture. It doesn't matter that I'm on my knees necessarily, but I'm putting myself in a humble posture to say, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are the Lord of my identity. You are the Lord of my finances. You are the Lord. Watch, watch. Some of us haven't trusted God with our finances yet. We have not. And I feel that in my spirit. And you have said, Jesus is my Savior. He's my Savior. But if he is your Lord, he owns every single part. Every part. And you say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my finances. Watch him provide. Watch a check show up in your mailbox. And I'm not a prosperity preacher. I don't believe in that stuff. I believe in miracles. I believe in the miraculous favor of God. When you submit yourself to him, you resist the devil. You resist the devil right here. That bending will lead to boldness. And then you can stand up and say, in Jesus' name. Why? Because Christ no longer, or I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is what I want for you all. Would you stand to your feet this morning? So Romans 14, and we'll be done in just a moment. Romans 14, sorry, I'm skipping a couple slides here, Matt. I, I get really passionate about this stuff because I want this for you. I want this for you. Spend more time on your knees before him than Instagram. Spend more time on your knees before him. And I'm saying this to me. I'm putting myself right there with you. And watch everything else. So Romans says this, you then, who judge your brother and sister, you treat them with contempt, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, this is what will happen. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. Are you with me? Can we praise the Lord for that? Amen. Okay, here's my concern. Let's go back one time. My concern is that many of us will bow for the first time there. Don't wait till then. You don't want to do that. And I love you too much to not tell you that. That eternity is on the line. Everyone from LeBron James to Donald Trump to the poorest, the richest, the most successful, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. And I just felt this so much in my heart. You know, it says that the, the, the second coming of Jesus will come when no one expects it. That when we're distracted and we're obsessing about all these other things, God says, be kingdom-minded this morning. Come back to your first love. Come back to your first love. That's what Jesus told me in the past few weeks. Because the calling became my God. The work became my God. And Revelation, it says Jesus stands. And what does it say? He knocks on the door. But he knocks on the door because he's so in love with you, he wants relationship with you. It all comes from love. So he knocks on the door of your heart. And he says, I know that you kind of think you're your own boss and your own God, but I love you so much that even before I'm telling you this now, I already went to the cross for you. I gave my life for you. I went and paid the penalty to literally let you free so that you could go and tell you this morning, where are your accusers now? By the blood of Jesus, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But let's go to the last verse. Each one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Like, that's an exciting thing, and that's also like a terrifying thing. Are you with me, right? And my prayer for you, whether you're watching online or in the room, is my prayer is that you would not wait to bow your knee until judgment day. But you would say, today is the day. Today is the day. No, no, no. Not, hey, hey, I'll, I'll accept Jesus when it's like cool with me and I kind of like figure it out. No, no, no. Jesus is come and follow me today. Drop your nets, sell everything you own and follow me. And he leads us into abundant life. And some of you might make that decision this morning, but here's the last point. We'll be done in just a moment. This moment is your motivation. So for some of us, to bring it full circle, you know, okay, I've been called to do something. I have a race. I have a lane. But Andy, I'm not really sure if I just have enough to like go for it. If you don't have the motivation for it, which I'm right there with you, let the moment that you meet God face to face be your motivation. When I have nothing left to give Aliana and Lienz, I'm trying to pour into them. Or I'm trying to pour into the church and I just feel like I have nothing left. The spirit has been reminding me, Andy, one day you will stand before me. 
And instead of your boss being your motivation, instead of that partner church being your motivation, instead of the likes being your motivation, instead of your family, your friends, let the only thing that motivates you be the well done, good and faithful servant. I heard a pastor say this, let the only applause that you crave, let it be the resurrected, nail-scarred hands. That the only time you hear this, the only time you crave that is from his hands, the nail-scarred hands, the one that paid the price for you, the one that knows you by name, the one that shed his blood for you, the one that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but I am patient with you. He's patient. And I'm so thankful that even when we are faithless, he is faithful. That even in the moments where we're like, God, I want to give you all, but I don't know how to. He's so kind. He's so gracious and he helps us. He guides us. He doesn't force us, but he guides us. He says, I know you don't want to give me your finances. I know you don't want to give me your relationships, but can I just show you in my word? Can I just show you through miracles that, that I am who I say and that I am trustworthy? See, Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. Why do I share this? Because when we cast off restraint, it's just another way to say, I don't care anymore. Maybe that's how you feel about your life right now. And maybe someone who's watching online or in the room, like you, you would say, I don't care enough to the point where like you're willing to take your own life, you don't care. And I feel like I'm talking to someone right now. Can I just let you know whoever that is? God is not done with you. He loves you. We rebuke that spirit of suicide in Jesus' name. That's not from him. Can I get an amen? amen? That you are worthy of his love. He shed his blood for you. He has a calling for you. He has not given up on you. I don't know who I'm talking to. But this isn't about behavior modification. This is about vision. See, the vision of meeting God face to face motivates me for what I do for one church. That's my motivation. I don't know where you're coming from. But I encourage you, live your life in reverse from that moment. Live your life in reverse from that moment. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? God, thank you. For your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, God. And right now, with the gospel being preached, if there's anyone that wants to say, Jesus, I don't want you to just be my Savior, but I want you to be my Lord of my life, would you just raise a hand right now, if that's you? There's no shame or condemnation. Anyone else in the room want to make that decision to give Jesus everything this morning? Let's pray this prayer together out loud, just with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, forgive us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your blood shed for me. I received the good news. You died for me. You rose for me. You are my Lord. And you are my Savior. I received the Holy Spirit. And I live for you all the rest of my days. And the last response with heads bowed and eyes closed, just real quick, if there's anyone that feels like they're already a believer, but there's just a heaviness on you this morning. Maybe it's a heaviness of discouragement, of doubt. And even this whole time while we've been sharing the word and worship, you just still feel that burden on your shoulders. Would you just lift a hand right now, just as a sign of the Lord to say, God, I just need you right now. Father, you see the, the arms outstretched, and I pray what Isaiah prayed that would be fulfilled by you, that Jesus, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on us. For you have anointed us to proclaim the good news that you come, Jesus, and I pray for, for this entire group with their hands raised online in the room. You, you come to earth, Lord, so that we who are brokenhearted would be bound up in you, Lord. That where there is a spirit of despair, of discouragement this morning, that you would fill them with a garment of praise, that you would bring beauty from the ashes, that people who even look in the mirror and see themselves as worthless 
or have no value, God, I pray you'd speak and remind that value and identity right now, God, that they are chosen, they are beautiful in your eyes, that when you look at them, you don't see the abuse, you don't see the trials, but you see your son. You see the cross, Lord, you see them as your children. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen and amen. Out of this posture, I just invite you to worship the Lord. We're gonna celebrate. And one thing the Lord told my wife and I this week is celebration is your weapon. That when you align yourself with God, you align yourself with his promises for you and you speak like it's already done, you celebrate. And when you clap your hands, it's like you're activating a weapon of worship. I just invite you for this last song, we're gonna celebrate, we're gonna praise God that he has clothed us with a spirit of worship. Can I get an amen? All right, let's praise the Lord and we'll be done.